You go first because you're the oldest. And I'm going to let you start because when I start, I need to stop. Um, I started uh, in 1953. Gilbert McFarland had been here one year. He came in 52. I came in 53. And I've been here ever since. Um, it's a great time in my life. I always told people about the choir. The choir made the music. Mr. McFarland made the choir. And he was a great gentleman, a statesman. Uh, he, he taught us obedience. He taught us how to worship. And how to be a gentleman. Oh boy, that was noisy. I'm sorry. <laughs> we got Gilbert McFarland from <clears throat> Watertown, New York. Right. And uh, with trepidation, he wasn't sure what he was getting into when he came here because he'd only visited once. And at the time, the Roosevelt organ was still in place. I preceded Vance by at least three years. Uh, the Roosevelt Consul was right behind us back here, and they were in contract with Shaughnessy Organ Company, the builders, to rebuild and replace the old instrument. Well, there's correspondence in the archives uh, from Shaughnessy to the former choirmaster, my choirmaster, Jack Rogers about what was to go in the organ and where it was to be and the scope of the work. And then suddenly the correspondence changed to between uh, Sean's Organ Company and Dean Orville Wicker, who was my dean. Okay. And then the next thing I know <clears throat> is this piece of correspondence from the organist and choir master of Christ Church Cathedral, Gilbert McFarlane, <laughs> Uh, making a couple of adjustments and finalizing what that organ was going to be. Well, that letter was written on stationery from Trinity Episcopal Church in Watertown, New York. He hadn't even gotten here yet. One of the things I remember as being a, a choir boy was the, the initiation part. They had in one of the back rooms, they had mats, like tumbling mats. And I don't know at what point in your first career, you, but they would take you back there and your shirt would come up and all of a sudden you'd have 10 guys over there beating on your stomach, calling it red belt. <laughs> so if it wasn't that, you might get stuffed in a locker. They'd push you in a locker, shut the door, and leave you in there for maybe 10 or 15 minutes. Or you might be taken down in the catacombs. You get down there, the lights would go off, you mm -hmm. couldn't see anything. And that was just part of the initiation. It was, it was something, a lot of fun. So you started in 53 and you and probably? Probably 50, 50, because that goes back to the onus of needing to be 10 years old. <laughs> and I'm a warrior baby, I was born in 1941, which would have made me 10 or after. But I remember distinctly uh, biding my time after, time after Sunday school one Sunday. My brother comes back from the choir house after the service, and I remember the words Jack wants to see you. And I was a mere nine and a half. Well, Jack was Jack Rogers. He had about two more years with us before he left for, for another position. We managed to always play around on the on the piano, and the next thing I know, I am what they back then called a sprout. And we sang and rehearsed for about a month, then we were allowed to join the choir in church. That was roughly 1950, and I remember that I shared with you earlier. Uh, we always had confirmation bishops visitation <clears throat> on Sunday. Well, I was confirmed in this church on Sunday, 1953. If you check the church records, 1953 was the last year that we had Bishop Klingman. In fact, Bishop Klingman signed my confirmation record. 
Well, it was also the first year of Bishop Marmion. We had a suffragan and a coadjutor. So when I went to the communion rail, it was Bishop Marmion who matched on my head. How many boys were in the choir? Uh, that was sort of the secret of made the choir work. Unlike young ladies, God does a nasty trick on young boys. It's called puberty. He takes our voice from us. Right. <laughs> so on a good run, a youngster from age 10 will have a very good treble or soprano voice for about four to five years. So the goal was to have four classes, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, with probably four voices in each class. That way the choir master knew that each year he was going to lose uh, four to five voices. So the goal was to make sure he had four or five new voices coming in. Age 10 saw two things. First of all, believe it or not, there was a waiting list. Mm -hmm. Kids wanted to be in the choir. Right. Secondly, it was an old choir master rule. He knew he was going to have to teach you how to read music. He didn't want to have to teach how to read. So he wanted to make sure you had enough school in there. So consequently, we would always have from somewhere between a dozen to 20 treble voices that would either go on to be acolytes or if they were able to retain enough of their voice, an alto, a tenor, and then of course you had adults to fill in the adult voices. The picture you have there, I think, there was probably 35 people in the choir at that time. That was, I believe that picture was probably around 1955, 56. Somewhere 55 maybe. Someone asked one time, and Mr. Mack had a lot of problems with the kids, and it really didn't because the kids, I think they had enough respect for Mr. Mack that they kind of took care of their problems. Mack didn't have a lot of discipline issues which was a good thing. Good run, we had, we had fun. <laughs> had a little incident in one time with snowball throwing the car. <laughs> that the gentleman didn't appreciate and came chasing us into the church and the choir room. Mr. Mack stood up and said, my boys wouldn't do that. You must be mistaken. <laughs> you rehearsed in the, in the room that's still the choir room? No, was, was, what is now referred to as Dean's, Dean's Hall. Hall. The choir house, big rehearsal area, a library, choir master's office, vesting room, and a small basketball room. Tumbling room. And when we were discussing one time how much space was dedicated for that purpose, Mr. Mike pointed out that the cubic foot area that we rehearsed in loosely equal the cubic foot area that we're sitting in, in the chancel. So it made it a very good rehearsal area. Before the renovation of the diocesan house, the cathedral house had uh, a main room on the main floor. The second floor divided into Sunday school room, which was actually an auditorium with a stage, right. and some risers. The third floor was a balcony for the auditorium. We've got pictures um, on the, in the bishop's letter, I think when Bishop Army was consecrated here, it was what, 54, somewhere around there. The choir was processing out the garden, which didn't look anything like it does now. Plus in the backdrop, the porch was there. There was no buildings. It was just a choir going out following that. <laughs> we were both in that picture, buddy. Yeah. Do you have any favorite anthems? That's an issue I have sometimes. I, I don't feel that we dig deep enough back into the library, the music that we sang years and years ago. It, it, people want a little bit more modern stuff, if you will. But one of my favorite Christmas anthems was uh, Born Today. It's failing. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. We did it several years uh, as a bit in Boys Choir. And when John Cantrell was here, he had an adult choir. 
that made the first CD that we put out. We rehearsed and rehearsed and rehearsed this failing. It didn't make the cut, but yet as youngsters, we would do that every day. Yeah, it's tough, tough piece of music. Yeah. I said something to um, Daniel um, way back. I said, that'd be a good anthem to bring out for Christmas. He said, we might do that. Folks don't realize that we were pretty much <clears throat> on the cutting edge uh, through our history. Music, obviously, because we devoted a tremendous amount of time. But especially from Alan Bartlett's years as Dean, when we were going through prayer book uh, revision, if there was a trial service, if there was trial music, if there was anything coming down the pike, it got done here. And we managed to not only do it fairly well, but meet a large number of church-wide musicians uh, who were generating a lot of this work. Well, you know, really back then, Edgar, it was considered one of the finest choirs in the South. We participated in about three or four three choir festivals. Uh, Christ Church Cathedral, Louisville, Christ Church Cathedral, Lexington, and St. Mark's, Louisville, which during those years had a very, very strong uh, men and boys choir in addition to the full choir. Uh, Alec Whiteman right. uh, was guest the year that we were in Lexington, so we did one of his anthems. Yeah, Jackson, Francis Jackson yeah. was one. Jerry talked okay. about when the voices changed, most of us stayed in the choir and went to Alco Tenor. But at the end of that time, we would be presented with our own hymnal. And this was presented to me. Uh, it, it says, to Wallace Vance Fritton, upon his graduation from the soprano section of Christ Church Cathedral Choir, in recognition of four years and 11 months of faithful service, it was signed by the dean, the choir master, and this, in my case, was dated April 13, 1958. Yeah. So we all got one of these when we graduated from the soprano section. On October 12, 1980, the Cathedral Choir of Men and Boys did right. even song in the National Cathedral. It's really neat to go up there and sing. It was quite an honor. But Wow. The thing that struck me and a lot of the adults was when the young choir boys walked into that cathedral and their, their jaws dropped. They had never seen a space that big or that right. beautiful. I mean, it was, it was something else. It was a nice time. It was a, big, it was a credit to this cathedral choir. So then when was the last men and boys choir? When? Mr. Max came in 52 and he retired in 74. So I can't remember how much longer it went. Maybe till like 1980 maybe? We were over 90 years when it finally changed. Um, we did have one gentleman that was in the choir when we were growing up who would already been in the choir for 50 years. It was Alvin Cornwall. And uh, just an old stately gentlemen. Just, we've had a lot of good people.